Okay. So, uh, hello again. I would uh, uh, like to take this opportunity and thank the Gertner Institute, uh, who is actually supporting this summer school, and we, uh, it's important to acknowledge them. Um, I also want to thank a male, Dr. Mayor Goldschmidt, who is here, and he will uh, help us during the tours, breaks, everything you want, ask him, he knows. Okay, so the next speaker today is me. And this is the privilege of being one of the organizers. You can actually put yourself uh, early. Okay, <clears throat> so before I start, I have, uh, I need actually to show you quickly a disclosure uh, um, thing, uh, slide, unfortunately. So just read it. And what's important is my presentation does not reflect the company's views. Okay. And now, this is NIH regulation, so I have to do it. And now, let's talk about some science. So, our lab is studying how to manipulate cellular function in order to generate novel therapeutic approach to treat mainly leukocytes implicated diseases. And this is a huge field that include blood cancer, okay, I'll do this, blood cancers, inflammation, and viral infection, and uh, actually we're quite occupied in each of those buckets. And I will try today to show you some examples and to trigger your mind in thinking about strategies, in some, some examples, not all of them, which are um, here marked by blue. So the lab is divided into two major groups, people that are doing drug delivery systems, and this is this, this arm, protein engineering and ligand engineering to get targeting agents, and of course target discovery and validation, uh, mostly with RNA interference, libraries and, or targets. And basically, you're going to hear a lot about this uh, tomorrow and on Tuesday. So the ideal situation is to try and merge between the sides, between those two sides, and create what we call the personalized approach or a precision approach tailoring not only the carriers, but also the selective targeting agent and the specific therapeutic payloads. And I think that we are now entering an era where this could be actually happening. So I'm going to start telling you a few stories. You will see at the end that they're all connected. And I'm going to be a bit brutal even. And hopefully you will... Uh, uh, be brutal as well in asking, you know, in this is a known subcycle regulating molecule that by binding to cyclin dependent kinase four and six govern the proliferation of both normal and malignant cells. And it was known that cyclin D1 is a known therapeutic target for cancer, and I'm going to go into this in a few more slides. But actually, nobody knew why in a set of disease called inflammatory bowel diseases, both Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and chronic puchitis, cyclin D1 is apparently upregulated both in the epithelial cells and in leukocytes and immune cells. It was known that there is a connection between overexpression or constitutive expression of cyclin D1 in epithelial colorectal dysplasia and carcinogenesis. Basically, it's probably one of the triggers. However, in leukocytes, it wasn't really known. And we had a few questions about this. this. Is it contribute to the pathogenesis of inflammation? And can it serve the therapeutic target? And we set up very naively, I would say, um, a strategy to target gut mononuclear leukocytes, so basically circulating cells, okay, with the idea that we can use this RNAi approach using small interference RNA and silence cyclin D1 and experimental colitis model. 
Now, before that, I have to explain a few things from a pathology standpoint. Okay, so it is, it's known that for some reason, we don't know exactly the reason, it may be a microbiome issue now, or in immune cells with the bacteria, we don't know what's happening in the gut. But basically, we know that there is a homing that occurs from the circulation into the gut. And there is an upregulation of specific homing receptors on lymphocytes, potentially also on monocytes, that will target and infiltrate the tissue. By doing this, they destroy the tissue. And there are ways to mitigate this destruction. One of them is to use an anti-homing or anti um, uh, anti-receptor, a monoclonal antibody that basically block this migration. There was also a hypothesis back in 2005 that um, cycling D1 is responsible not only for proliferation of cells but also for migration. And there was a very bizarre connection, bizarre in terms of scientific publication that were actually in a very good journal, showing that there is a connection between proliferation and migration of leukocytes, of immune cells, which eventually became totally irrelevant and probably not even correct. So this was our main focus, trying to understand what's going on with, with cycling D1, and can it serve as a potential therapeutic target if it really contributes to the pathogenesis of inflammation in the case of inflammatory bowel disease. Now, <clears throat> when one looks at receptor potential receptor targets for delivery of therapeutic payloads, and Rimona very nicely mentioned, you know, the basic behind us, if you look for RNAi, there you need the therapeutic, you need your carrier to either internalize and then release the payload, which is the RNAi payload. And it could be an siRNA, a microRNA, a modified messenger, and it could be anything. It could be a DNA, plasmid. <clears throat> but you need a few very important markers in order for the system to work. So we were looking for receptor targets for nucleic acid delivery, and there are many options. And we chose to work on leukocytes integrins, because integrins are the largest family of cell adhesion molecules that mediate cell to cell and cell to matrix interaction. And the dogma coined by Tim Springer more than 24 years ago how leukocytes interact with endothelial cells in a very defined process that has four stages. And if you look at the importance of leukocytes integrins on those endothelial cells and their interaction maybe between the leukocyte and the endothelial cells, they play a pivotal part. So if I summarize maybe in three points, why integrins could be good receptor targets for siRNA delivery <coughs> to leukocytes, I would state the following three statements. The first one, that the family, it's a family of cell adhesion molecules that have alpha and beta subunits. So the first one is the beta-7 and beta-2 integrins are exclusively expressed in leukocytes and you cannot find them in any other cell type, for sure. So you get a level of specificity. If you want to use something that is robust and is expressed on all cells, go to the beta-1 integrin. There is actually not a single cell that do not express beta-1 integrin. And it was carefully looked for many, many years. So it's the other side of the story. Now, Integrins, or leukocytes integrins from the beta-7 and beta-2 families are constitutively and very fast recycled. Very fast, it means that they, when they bind the ligand, and we'll talk about potential ligand, when they bind their ligand, they take it up quickly 
In human T cells, this process costs it's about 45 seconds. Now just imagine that you are now a vehicle. You could be a polymer, you could be a nanoparticle, you could be whatever you like. And now you have a coating on the surface with a natural ligand or with an antibody that binds one of those integrins. And it binds and it could recycle very, very fast. So it can take up also your carrier and hopefully also inside the payload will be released and it's a different story. So from a targeting standpoint, the second criteria which is crucial, so the first one is specificity. The second one is how fast it's recycled, basically how fast it internalizes into the cells. Okay? And just imagine that you're working with immune cells, with leukocytes that are not resident like macrophage in tissues or dendritic cells, but circulating targets. And the third one, third option, gives you another layer of specificity, which is using a conformational change that happens in some of the leukocytes integrins and potentially in other adhesion molecules. This gives you another layer of specificity. So potentially now you can target only activated cells while leaving naive cells untouched. And I'll give you an example later on. A word of caution, however. Now, the problem with drug targeting, and actually I can change the title of my talk and say to target or not to target. This is the question. And if you now look at cross-linking receptors, this could be also an issue because you can enhance an outside-in signaling event. And if you're going after inflammation, it's not a really good thing to create proliferation based on, on cross-linking receptors, which is one event that could happen, could be others. So I just want to bring you back to what I've said in the beginning. So we were interested in gut leukocytes or in gut at home, leukocytes at home to the gut, from the bone marrow to the circulation and from the circulation into the gut. And the beta-7 integrin family is highly expressed in the gut area. If you look at a, a lymphoid organ, such as the purse patch, there are specialized T cells that express the alpha-4 beta-7, the lamina propria express alpha-4 beta-7, the mesenchymal lymph node express alpha-4 beta-7, uh, intraepithelial lymphocytes express alpha-E beta-7, and we know there is a crosstalk between them. So, Again, the idea was, can we develop a system small enough that will be decorated with a, either a natural ligand or an anti-beta-7 uh, monoclonal antibody or its fragment, inject it into the circulation, and hope that you'll have a classical Trojan horse effect, that it will enter the cell, release the payload, the payload should be sRNA again cycling D1, release the payload, and then maybe, maybe this aberrant proliferation would be blocked and will have less migration. This was the hypothesis. And this hypothesis was proved to be completely incorrect. So you can smile, but you can also be sad. Because, you know, a, a scientist, at least a young scientist, really, when he hypothesizes thing, he wants to prove the hypothesis or disprove it. And this is a classical disprove it because something else is happening. On the good side of it, it generated a lot of interesting results. On the bad side, we proved that the hypothesis and the connection between migration and proliferation is not completely correct. So, what we have done is create a liposome, basically, that was small enough through extrusion and coated with a glycosaminoglycan that Ramona mentioned, hyaluronan, that here acts as a scaffold for putting a monoclonal antibody or a fragments, which is an anti-integrin beta-7, and we can encapsulate sRNAs after condensation with human recombinant protein. And um, 
and this was published. And one of the things I want to show you is the specificity. So if you carefully look now, if you label the antibody on the surface or its fragment by a green dye, such as Alexa 488, and inside you have an sRNA which is a Psi 5 label, Psi 3 labeled, okay? You can see how nicely they can penetrate into those uh, uh, lymphocytes, okay? If you take now an isotype control and you label it, and basically do the same experiments, you don't really see anything but autofluorescence, and you use sRNA per se, and they don't really enter. And this is an important thing about sRNA and leukocytes. Actually, even cells that sample the environment, such as macrophage and disease, do not really take sRNA themselves. We're going to talk today, and after me as well, about some immune issues. And I'm going to open you some doors. And after me, Moin Moghimi will further, after lunch, talk about complement issues which I think should be very interesting. But one of the things that we have done and became kind of a hallmark for people that are looking at targeting is to do uh, the condition at the flow chamber and basically look at uh, beta-7 knockouts. So if you have now no expression of the knockout, okay, so basically you don't have a beta-7 expression, you have a knock knockout, you don't see any binding or any internalization, and everything is very, very fast very fast. So, what was the story about, about uh, cycling D1? So, in vivo silencing, and this, I think, this is the reason why it went uh, very interesting, because we found that cycling D1 has another role that is completely not related to proliferation. It has actually uh, related to induction of, or triggering of some of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So now, if you now look carefully, you see that um, some of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as TNF-alpha, IL-2P40, which share this unit with IL-23, are down-regulated by the simple cycling D1 down-regulation in vivo. It means, and we verify this by different sequences, and we have seen that there is no off-target effect, and we have looked beyond this, uh, and so that, that uh, even different sequence give it, and it's very specific to cycling D1 and not to D2 and D3. But basically, nothing happened to anti-inflammatory cytokines. Okay? So as an example, you have here uh, uh, IL-10 and IL-4. Now, this is a very interesting approach. Even now you have a tool to manipulate or change between a pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory, or you have a very elegant biological artifact. And apparently, it's not a biological artifact. So apparently, there is something behind this, and the mechanism relates to the fact that cycling D1 is also a co-transcription factor. So I'm not going to go into the details right now, but there are papers already showing this. So I think it's interesting to look at this. So we could actually block intestinal inflammation very elegantly and show that by using those uh, carriers with cycling D1, okay, this is a normal healthy mice that gain weight, about eight weeks old. These are the ones that have induction of colitis. This is the one that have the antibody but have an irrelevant siRNA. So you can see you can block very nicely intestinal inflammation, but it's not enough. There is something beyond this. And this is the guys that uh, have the cycling D1. So if we look carefully now at the data, and we look as an example for gut histology, without being an histology, you can understand that this is an intergut. You have goblet cells, you have muscles, and you have leukocytes inside. But if you now have a colitis or Crohn's, you'll have infiltration of lymphocytes, mainly, potentially also some monocytes, into the tissue. So we'll have destruction of the tissue structure, which is something like this. 
And if we get this uh, so-called drug, you will get something like this, which is interesting, but it's not curing. Okay? So this is just to give you a sense. Now, we thought that if we have a strategy to target leukocytes systemically, can we use it simultaneously for imaging? Can we image or can we target those beta-7 integrins in a colitis model? This is actually a human colon okay, with inflammation. So it's an ulcerative colitis. Um, and to do this, we collaborate with Alan Packard at Children's Hospital in Boston. We took the antibody, which is a, against the beta-7 integrin. We put a chelator on it, and we put copper-64 as an imaging agent. Okay, and this basically, this is just to give you a sense, these are the kidneys, and this is the liver. So what happened, if we induce colitis, we could get very high uptake in intestinal inflammation region, about 7.5% of the injected dose, everything else is disseminated differently in a single IV injection. If we take a control monoclonal antibody, you'll see that mostly everything goes to the liver and minimal is going into the area, into the gut. Of course, this is a sensation for molecular imaging. And just imagine that companies, and this is, you know, we are going to start talking a little bit about translation, and companies that looked at this data saying, okay, this is, this is very good, this is amazing. And without giving you too much information, this was very quickly from 2010, from a manuscript, went into a very quickly phase one, very quick phase two, and entering from November last year to a phase three clinical trial. Not as a blocking antibody, but as an imaging agent. So I think that this is a very unique uh, situation where people or where a patient of Crohn's colitis will be able to get something I thought it's unbelievably dangerous, to get some radiation, okay? Because PET, it's a PET CT, what you're seeing here, and, and basically PET means some radiation with the CT. So we have a radioactive nucleotides there, uh, but apparently Crohn's patients, the ones that are heavily in, in, in the middle of the disease, I would say, or in a, in a, in a floor, during a flare, actually, uh, sometimes are imaged three to five times a year with a CT. So um, this is a more targeted and molecular imaging uh, approach and could be combined with drugs to get a teranostic approach. Um, and if I'll have more time, or maybe in, later on, I'll show you what I mean. I want to give you another example how we can use RNAi to validate target. Now, you know that there are many options, and here I have to um, tell you a story that relates to cycling D1, but the disease is different. And we collaborate with Alnylan Pharmaceuticals and IDT to create a very potent sRNA against cycling D1 or a DISA substrate. And the disease, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, is uh, mantle cell lymphoma. Mantle cell lymphoma is actually a mature B cell malignancy. And this disease is very unique because we actually know the hallmark, the genetic hallmark of the disease. You cannot really say on many other diseases that you know the pathway and you know the genetic hallmark, how it starts. What's the, what's the key point here? And in mantle cell lymphoma, we know that there is a, a junk depose of the cycling D1 gene into the Ig heavy chain gene. So now, B cells that should not express cycling D1 in a normal situation are constitutively expressing cycling D1. It could be 15,000 fold increase in the messenger level. It could be 3,000 to 30,000. It depends on the protein level. So now, constitutively active, it means that they're proliferating all the time. Okay. In addition, we also know that this uh, very unique translocation carry a very high number of secondary chromosomal alteration. 
It's very hard to treat those patients and they will all die. Now, there was a paper suggesting in 2008 that cycling D1, this was the title, is not therapeutic target for mantle cell lymphoma. It was done with an shRNA approach with virus, virus vectors. The work we have done with Al Nylon was very hard and, and IDT was very hard to publish because the dogma was already that cycling D1 is not a therapeutic target. And now if you come with the opposite title, cycling D1 is a therapeutic target, you have a problem to publish. It took a long time and very robust data to show that it's, it's actually a target. Okay, so we show that not only you get block of the proliferation, but you also get apoptosis in cells. But RNAi for therapeutics, this is very, very challenging. <laughs> now this is a slide I got from colleagues at Merck, who actually gives you an overview of the multiple challenges that there are to develop an RNAi-based therapeutics. And you can see that it starts with the chemical stability of, when I say siRNA, it's actually also for microRNAs, mimetic or antagomers. Um, formulation or encapsulation, clearance, of course, if we talk about systemic, biodistribution, the tissue of choice, if targeted, the number of siRNAs per receptor interaction, endocytosis, unpackaging, endosomal escape, risk binding, okay, messenger RNA cleavage, inhibition, etc., etc., on and off target activity, immune activation and toxicity, I'm going to spend some time on this, and how the cell deposit the oligos and the vehicles. Now, we know that many scientists, including Phil Sharp, always say that since RNAi is a catalytic process, it doesn't need more than 400 to 500 molecules per cell to get a very robust and efficient knockdown. This is a very general <laughs> issue. However, if you carefully look at this and you calculate the number of molecules we bring to a cell, in the lower end we are in million copies, millions of copies. So how the cell cope with this and how, how it copes with the siRNA or the messenger or the microRNA, how it cope with the delivery vehicle, what's going on? And this could induce a lot of issues. So back in 2009, beginning of 2010, there were several companies, and we're going to hear a little bit about this uh, tomorrow and on Tuesday, that started clinical trials and stopped them due to what they call flu-like syndrome. Basically, some patients experience at the high doses some flu-like syndrome, and they said, we know flu-like syndrome is a cytokine storm. And the flu-like syndrome was a little bit uh, fever, you know, some muscle pain, etc. So, it was known that exogenous double-strand RNA can activate antiviral defenses in mammalian cells through basically an interferon response, and if kappa B dependent <coughs> pathways. The work of Joan Barty that was published in 2008 teaches us that siRNA, which are 19 to 21 nucleotides, also can antagonize TOLAC receptor 3 and potentially 7 and 8 in a sequence-dependent and independent manner. We also know that the clinical trials, at least the company reported, to mitigate the risk of exactly what was published in Nature, there are several chemical modifications which are very, very crucial, special chemical modification of the sRNA or RNAi payloads. Example, lock nucleic acid, 2-O-methylated, 2-fluoromethylated, et cetera, et cetera. So something is happening, and we don't know what's happening. Are we experience what we call immune or nanotoxicity? Is it the carrier charge, shape, size, composition, curvature. Is this is something that happens only in leukocytes, in immune cells. 
What about the combination between sRNA and the carrier? These are all many questions. And we wanted to start very simply to, to analyze what's going on. And here I have to give uh, credit to Mayer for this slide. So basically, if we take a macrophage as an example that has toll-like receptors on it, could be four in the case of LPS, we know that it's inducing after attachment to LPS a pro-inflammatory signal and the, the expression of TNF, alpha, and other pro-inflammatory cytokines will create recruitment and activation of T cells, macrophages, and endothelial cells. We also know that at some point we'll have a resolution. The opposite signal will happen and there is a reciprocal role basically between TNF and IL-10 and you will see that an anti-inflammatory signal is given and blocks this recruitment and activation. So one of the things we wanted to do, again, to digest it very simply, we started with three different lipid-based nanoparticles. One of them has a cationic charge, one of them has an anionic charge, and one of them has a neutral in charge. They are all at the range of 100 nanometer in diameter by electron microscopy, and by DLS, dynamic light scattering. Okay, and this is the zeta potential measurement. And the idea was, what's happened if we put them in an equivalent macrophage? In this case, it was human fibroblasts, because fibroblasts, also, some of them have TLRs. And what we have found, that in a, using an in-cell 2000, basically a whole throughput microscopy, we looked at the profile chart and the profile chart was a bit surprising. So there are lots of parameters here, from a, cell from a cell cycle into the membrane, into the nucleus, into the mitochondria, et cetera, et cetera, lots of parameters. But basically, this image, I think it's easier to understand. So you have a, a mitochondrial marker, you have a, a cytoplasm marker, which is the calcium AM, you have a nucleus marker, and you have a merge. And basically, we see that the cells are dying. Cells are dying. Only cells that come from a cationic formulation. In time, they can recover. What does it mean that they are dying? Maybe we titrate it not in the right manner. We don't really know. So mechanistically, we know that they are dying. We don't know from what. It could be a mitochondrial issue, it could be a DNA damage, it could be a lots of others. So one can move to the next level and start injecting it into mice, just C57 black 6 mice, nothing really seriously. And look what happened here. So here we see that these are the uh, cationic formulation and the global changes in body weight is decreased after four IV injections. But if you carefully see, also negatively charged and neutral in charge formulations also do not go up as the mock treated one. And the conclusion here is simple. There are no naive molecules. You know, if you now do any kind of analysis, you will find that anything you inject causes something. Sometimes we call it toxicity. I would call it learn about biology. Because from toxicity, we really understand biology. This is the only chance we have to understand what's going on. So I'm quickly going over and saying that we have discovered, after preparing this in an endotoxin-free environment, that those cationic nanoparticles, and only the cationic one, induce what we call a type 1 interferon response and triggering kind of dangerous signals. So you see that, that all the pro-inflammatory cytokines are going up within two hours and, and basically still up, but much less at 24 hours. I apologize for the slide. And if you look at different interferon responsive genes, it's all at the messenger level. They're all up and again up. Now a killer experiment to prove this will be to take, if you really think that it has a relationship to one of the TLR, and we bet on TLR4, just take a knockout and do the same experiment and sort the cells. And this is exactly what was done. 
And basically, we discover that those cationic nanoparticles agonizing TLR4. So now, if you carefully, just a second, if you carefully look at this, you'll find that sorted cells that are CD11B positive, basically monocytes, potential dendritic, maybe neutrophils, okay? They are all very high, but if you look at IL-13, there is nothing there because, again, it's not related, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at this, you'll find that these are not, again, these are all low, and the only ones that are very high are the ones that have sRNAs uh, that were published in Joe Ambarty that agonizing to like with hepto 3 So this is an interesting uh, example. This paper also did a very interesting thing that this was the first paper showing a phenomena that wasn't able, we, we couldn't able to explain it there, but was explained by Dan Littman a few years later. It was the first experiment that monocytes can secrete at the messenger level, or at least induce at the messenger level, IL-17, which is a, a T cell classical cytokine. Okay. Now, if we look at, at our system, we have not seen any uh, substantial induction. But again, if you look at, at the other options here, so everything is doing something. And if you look at interferon-responsive gene, the same happened, even if you go up to a 9 milligram per kilogram body SRNA, which is actually a lot. So, I will not talk about pegylation a lot, because Moin Mogimi will talk about this with regards to complement activation. But this is one of the work that we have done together. And basically, uh, we looked at PEG, everything above 2% and above, and we saw that it's actually activating the complement system. We've looked at our system and, and saw that there is no activation, and maybe Moin will basically uh, tell you a little bit more about this. I'm shifting gear to something which is, you know, potentially very simple but also uh, very interesting. How the immune system looks at different carriers. <clears throat> the dogma was that a globular shaped particle, anything below 50 nanometer in diameter will not be recognized as a globular shape because viruses are around 100 and above, bacteria are around one micron, there is no good reason why small particles could do this. And let's talk about stealth. And again, I want to thank Janusz Zabini and Hezi Berenholtz for this slide. Look carefully about doxy, liposomal doxorubicin. It's all electron microscopy. This is about 100 nanometer, maybe 90 nanometer. Lipids with a little bit of polyethylene glycol on the surface. And you can see the coffee bean of the doxorubicin inside. This is HIV-1. It has a lots of protein on the surface without peg. This guy, this guy, sorry, has another name, stealth. Stealth liposomes, okay, because they're you know, evading the immune system. However, we know today that at least 5 to 7% of the patient receiving pegylated liposomes may induce a lots of hypersensitivity issues. And at the end of the day, basically, this is due to the complement. But if we look about uh, on these HIV particles, viruses, <clears throat> they're really stealth. They penetrate into CD4 cells very quietly, start manufacturing new viruses and go out and basically proliferate, although this is not the correct term. So what's going on? How come these are stealth? These are not really stealth, although we want them to be stealth. Open question. I'm actually going to give you a few others to study. <clears throat> Another issue that I'm not going to get into this, but I have some feelings about this, is those two theories of the immune system, self, non-self, and danger theories. Different people, different strategies. Now there is an attempt 
to combine the theories into one big theory. But basically, we don't understand, we don't have really good proofs, we don't have tools to study this, and these are re really, really big questions. One of the things we wanted to see is to try to understand danger signals. Danger signals can happen because of cationic issues and because of hydrophobicity and because of anionic issues. We know that anionic particles could actually be signaled as nucleic acid by some of the TLR and also NLRs. We know that cationic formulations are also bad to immune cells. So only the one that the surface is neutral, then we have an intrinsic problem. What about hydrophobicity? So I told you that the dogma is very, very uh, naive, saying that 50 nanometers in below, the immune system should not be recognized. So together with Vince Rotello at UMass, we designed nanoparticles made of gold at 2 nanometer in diameter. Now if you start building short chain, and at the end of the chain, this is actually a short peg, and at the end of the chain you start having residues that are more and more hydrophobic, okay? and you injecting those into mice, you will find a correlation that basically said that hydrophobicity dictates immune response. Okay? And again, assuming that we have clean systems. I want to quickly summarize this part and tell you that we have generated lipid-based particle that could give potent silencing in vivo at doses of 2.5 mg per kg. Actually, I'll show you in a few more slides that we can go down dramatically. It was beta-7 specific and had the preferential accumulation in the inflamed gut. From a therapeutic standpoint, it suppressed some of the Th1 cytokines in the case of cyclin D1, TNF and R12 as an example, inhibit inflammatory tissue damage, and from a safety standpoint, we have not seen immunogenicity, did not, have, did not induce unwanted immune stimulation, and no release of liver enzyme, which I didn't talk about. However, <coughs> since we believe that this is a platform, the only thing you need to do is change the monoclonal antibody on the surface, or the ligand, or the targeting moiety. And of course, you can also change the payload. So I want to show you a work that also was published a few years ago <coughs> with collaboration uh, of the Shankar Lab at Texas Tech, the Kumar Lab at Yale, and Schultz Lab at Jackson Laboratory. And the idea was, can we get a leukocyte-directed sRNA delivery to suppress HIV-1 infection in humanized mouse? The mouse model that we use is a nod skid IL-2 receptor gamma chain knockout, or a RAG. And this supports long-term multilineage hematopoiesis from transplanted human CD34, positive hematopoietic stem and progenitors. Basically, this is a potential mouse that has a human immune system for a short time. But you can actually ask a lot of questions about this. So the Schultz lab at Jackson published this in cell in 2009 as the mouse. And the ability to ask a lots of biological questions and a kind of a robust model for asking immunological questions in this mouse model. Now, you have a very short time frame, basically, if you now infect those with HIV. But you can do this and you can now study some, some of the effects. As a delivery system, we just change the antibody to another antibody, which is, again, from an integrin family, but it's expressed on naive and activated leukocytes all around. It's the alpha L beta 2 integrin, or LFA1, lymphocytes function associate antigen 1. We have 
a few monoclonal antibodies against this target. And in terms of the payload, we use CD4 sRNA or CCR5. Just to show you some data, intravenous injection of those particles with CD4 sRNA, silent CD4 expression in resting T cells in those mice that have CD34 matopoietic engrafted uh, rag mice. And you can carefully see that what you get here is a very nice silencing in the blood, spleen, and liver of CD4s, but not of CD8. Now, if you use BAL, HIV BAL, which is a strain that enters through a core receptor named CCR5, and you silence it, and this is the total number of basically T cells, okay? It's a percent CD4, CD3. And each, each uh, uh, line here represents one mouse. So if you see, I've, after three IV injections, Okay, you can basically, at one mg per kg, you can basically abolish changes, okay, of the number of T cells. But if you look at the viral load using basically P24, you will see, and this is a logarithmic uh, made by ELISA, you can see that uh, you get still some kind of an effect here in the one that has challenge with HIV and treated with sRNA against CCR5. So it's kind of a preventive approach. And the idea was to create it a microbicide, a vaginal approach. And this is now under experiments in uh, non-human primates, in monkeys. So it has an effect. The issue is that we don't get a complete knockdown, knockout, sorry. We get the knockdown. So it's probably enough to get something like 30%, so 70% knockdown, that will still have enough activity. So now the strategy is to mix it with different sRNA that target different parts of the virus. Now, I wanted to go back for the term selectivity and specificity. So global immune suppression is one of the major problems associated with anti-inflammation. And I would like to say that selective activation dependent targeting to leukocytes is possible. It's not trivial, but it's possible. So when I start talking to you about 40 minutes ago, I told you about the three terms that I believe are very important, necessary, to target leukocytes or circulating cells. One, that you have an exclusive expression. Another one, that you get internalized very, very fast and hopefully take up the payload with you. And the third one, that if some of them undergo conformational changes upon binding, will give you another layer of, of, of specificity. And I want to talk a little bit about this. So, let's hope this is working. Okay. So what you're seeing here is the ligand binding domain of LFA1 that binds to, it's change a conformation, and binds to the natural ligand, which is ICOM1, intracellular adhesion molecule 1. And we generated a few years ago, together in, with Tim Springer, Juni Lieberman, and Mutumu Shimaoka, a monoclonal antibody that is a perfect and the first ligand mimetic based on crystal structure. So basically, we now have an antibody that looks like ICAM1, binds only activated leukocyte that change the conformation of this integrin, and it's very selective. So this is an example of the crystal structure in the low affinity, non-binding of LFA1, and this is the binding conformation. This is the ligand binding domain, and this is exactly, we call it L57 or L579, depending on the specificity. We have a few reagents. And this is very selective to ICAM1. Very specific, sorry, to LFA1, and it's basically the ligand mimetic of ICAM1. We have another antibody 
that targets both conformation, because it doesn't bind the ligand binding domain, but other area very close to this headpiece. Okay. So, together with Judy Lieberman, we change the, basically, change it from a complete IgG to a single chain and created fusion protein. The fusion protein was based on human recombinant truncated protamine. So now you can see the other options of delivery systems. And protamine is a positively charged protein that nucleates DNA in the sperm. So now you have a short version of it and you can basically mix it with sRNA. This is one transcript. So you have a single chain protein infusion protein in one trans transcript. A linker is shorter. I didn't actually draw the linker, uh, but it's a classical G4, uh, G4S linker four times. And, and basically, uh, you now mix it with sRNA. And we had two reagents. One is the AL57 protein infusion protein or conformational sensitive one. And the other one is the conformational insensitive. The sensitive binds only to the activated leukocytes, where the non-sensitive bind to both conformation. So if we look at the classical flow cytometry and we label those fusion protein, if we don't stimulate the cells, these are human PBMCs because we can only make those uh, with, with uh, the antibodies are human, anti-human. So, Basically, what you have here is a non-binding where there is no stimulation. And when there is a stimulation, it shifts. Now, the one that is uh, insensitive to the conformation bind anyhow on human PBMC. The stimulation could be anything from uh, chemical stimulation to chemokines to cross-linking a receptor of CD3 and... What we've done is to show that just using a surrogated marker such as the Q protein, Q70, we can get very uh, nice knockdown on only the activated population. So if you have a mixed population experiment, same cells, one are activated, the upper one, and non-activated, you have only a shift in the cellular population, only in the activated one, while leaving the ones that are non-activated, or we call it naive cells, untouched. And there, is a, and there is, of course, lots of other controls that were published. So, activation-dependent silencing in leukocytes is doable. I will shift gear to the last subject I'm going to talk. So, I talked about leukocytes, and there are other stories and, and lots of other data that we have. Actually, some very exciting one. But I would like to now shift to another non-leukocytes activity, which is on ovarian cancer. And the reason I'm actually going to tell you a little bit about ovarian cancer is because a strategy that uh, Rimona and myself developed almost yeah, about 10 years ago, a little more. Um, and I think it's a very unique approach because it's not a single nanoparticle, but clusters of particles. And it has a natural ligand that actually home them into CD44 variant cells. So ovarian cancer is a model for drug resistance. And the standard care of ovarian is usually a combination of chemotherapy, and surgery. Um, and in patients that has disseminated uh, tumors beyond the ovaries, most relapse and ultimately will unfortunately die due to the development of drug resistance. And drug resistance can arise due to many issues, but one of them, which was very well described, is efflux pump. And as an example, one of the most investigated pumps are the P-glycoproteins. And P-glycoprotein, an ATP-dependent binding cassette transporter, has broad substrate specificity. It's actually, in terms of NDR phenotype, is often associated with the offer expression of this uh, protein and efflux uh, almost anything up to a, a molecular weight of 1,000. And 
as a model, we used NAR cells, NCI-ADR resistant cells, and OVCAR8, the parent cells that are not expressing or mildly expressing PGP. And as I mentioned, the idea behind this is to do a cluster of particles and not a single particle. And in the cluster of particles, you can encapsulate many things, including nucleic acid, proteins, small molecules, etc., without changing the chemical properties. And the idea of putting on the surface hyaluronan, a natural ligand that endows basically those carriers with long circulation and active <coughs> cellular targeting to tumors expressing CD44 variants is essential. And there are many splice variants of CD44, and it's been investigated over the years. However, if you see carefully, if you look carefully, the standard form is expressed almost on all cells. The variants, the change between the variants and the standard form is the stem area. And this provides a lot of issue and actually good things, including the ability to screen patients. So you have now a, a potential biomarker for clinical trials. Okay? And there are lots of, uh, uh, there are lots of variants. Just to give you an example, nobody really knows what's happened when you have a variant. What we think happened is a conformational change because the interaction between CD44 variants and hyaluronic acid, CD44 is an adhesion molecule. It's very similar to leukocytes, integrates, and their interaction with their natural ligand. So, Possibly there is some conformational changes. We know that hyaluronan binds the ligand binding domain. And we have shown in a set of, of experiments that were published that you can package in those, uh, we call them gagomers, based on the glycosaminoglycan on the surface, can encapsulate from an insoluble to a very soluble drugs, and also nucleic acids. But one of the things which is an interesting fact is that they can recognize from the same patient in the vicinity of the tumor, the tumor, and not the normal tissue. So this is one example that, you know, I, I'm actually liking monoclonal antibodies a lot. And I really have a, a lot of sympathy for them. But this is an example why a natural ligand sometimes is better. Nature somehow teaches us something more that we cannot predict. So if we take, and, 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 and this example was published in 2011, there, there are a few patients in this manuscript taken from the operating room, all have head and neck cancers. And this is an example for thyroid tumor. And you can see that the surgeon, when he takes the thyroid, there is a, an area which is tumor, an area which is tumor free. And taking out leukocytes, purifying the tissue, and we are left only with the thyroid cells that could be cultured. And in a single cell suspension, you can actually fax them using flow cytometry. And you can see that if you use a pan-CD44 monoclonal antibody, this is one, for example, clone, a very famous clone, uh, IM7, it binds equally well to healthy or normal and cancerous tissue from the same patient. But now if you take a gagomer, basically the coating, it recognizes mainly the cancer cells and in a log shift, less the normal tissue. So you have a differential. This is one point. Another point is that size matters. Some of you already know that, right? So if you take now hyaluronan of different size, and if you now put on a chip doing a biocore studies, a surface plasma resonance studies, and you immobilize a CD44 on the chip, and you start floating in different molecular weight of hyaluronan, what will happen is that if you start very small, a small fragment like 6.5 kilodalton, the binding will be minimal if at all existing. And there in time, 
when you go up to 700, it will open more and more binding site. And it will not even leave the receptor. So the binding will be very tight. And if you go to a larger molecule, such as 1.5 million Dalton, okay, you will find that this thing is dominantly important. Now going back to the ovarian cancer, if you now want to look at mechanistic studies and you knock down PGP and you want to see how much drug is remaining in cells when you incubate those cells with a, a chemotherapy, let's say doxorubicin, okay, you can find out that when you have doxo, free doxorubicin, actually they are pumped out. So you don't have a lot if you now silence these guys. However, if you use a delivery system that will change the balance on the surface maybe, from in to out. So basically increase the influx versus the efflux. So you now have more drugs in the cell. You will find out that already they're basically bypassing the pumps. And if we look carefully, how do they look? So this is those NAR cells, the, the NCIDR resistant cells. This is the structure on electron microscopy, okay? But when you now treat them with the gagomers, you see those cluster of particles, and there is about 200, 300 nanometer in diameter clusters. So you have tiny particles inside, and now let's think in a sense of cluster bomb. So now they attach to the surface with the ligand, potentially, we're not sure, changing the conformation, and those tiny particles are getting in. How do we know that? Because we use, elect we, we use confocal microscopy. So with the help of uh, uh, Professor Doron Shabbat from the School of Chemistry, who synthesized for us some lipid with uh, Psi-5, okay, we can actually distinguish this. And you see I have lots of doxorubicin, etc. But already in a very short time, we already see them inside the cells. Now we see the lipids in the cells, we see the drug. I'm not sure about the coating. Maybe it's on the surface. But apparently, it's pushing in. And now the next level is, of course, looking for a model. And there are many models that could be done. And, and one of the simplest models is just a, a, a xenograft model that you implant the cells. In this case, they are GFP labeled, NAR cells. And you can see that over time, they're still expressing CD44 very high variant types, and you don't need to touch them because one of the major artifacts is who measure tumors. And if you measure with an electronic caliber, there is a good reason that those could be, you know, a bit change. So if you have visual optical or, or, or visual options, such as Maestro, IVIS, and other instruments, that basically you don't need to you can define the area of interest, and you don't need to measure with your own hands. You already have a potential approach for, for measuring without touching. One other issue that will be discussed over and over is an EPR effect, enhanced permeability and retention. Now you have to see that the, the tumors are vascularized. So histology is a very good tool to see this, because if these are the tumors, Oops, sorry. If these are the tumors, this is the skin, and you see you have new blood vessels around, it means that they're already, you know, vascularized enough. But now you need some analytical tool. You need to measure how much drug you have it. Of course, you want to measure also, if you want, the carrier. But if you measure the drug analytically, and this is with the HPLC, LCM, SMS, uh, a microgram per ml, just in the circulation, you can see that these are more circulating, the ones that have doxorubicin compared to, in, in the gagomers, compared to a regular free drug. And if you now look carefully at the biodistribution, which is the percent of injected dose per gram tissue, you find something very, very surprising. And what you find is that there is much less liver accumulation and this is surprising because lipid-based particles accumulate in the liver. This is one time point, 24 hours. They already should be full of them. So we're looking at the drug, and it's surprisingly it's not there. It's not in the liver. It's not in the spleen enough. 
and it's not in the kidneys. It seems that it's in the tumor, but again, this is surprising evidence. Because we also know that hepatocytes have a lot of receptors for hyaluronan. So why does they don't, why it's not holding them inside? Probably the reason is conformation. Because we know that hyaluronan binds very weakly to CD44 standards. So it has to be something related to the conformation. So it's another evidence. And of course, at the end, you want to see how it translated. And we have other data, but this is an example uh, for how head-to-head -head comparison with other drugs, including doxil, can actually strike these tumors. So I'm going to just summarize this and tell you that in this case, we saw targeted to tumor cells by a natural ligand to CD44 variants. In vitro targeting of CD44 expressing variant cancer cells and in vivo expressing activated form of CD44, it has an enhanced drug accumulation to tumors. In terms of effectivity, it looks effective. In terms of safety, it looks safe. And in terms of payload versatility, you have lots of options. The take-home message is much more complex. You have to study your own delivery system in the context that will provide the best information. You have to do a thorough job looking at toxicity, immune toxicity, liver toxicity, kidney toxicity. And if you do it very early, you will be able to benefit from knowledge as well as to change your strategy accordingly. Because if we test in a fennel manner many systems, we found that m most of them could bypass the efficacy stage. So they could be efficacious, efficacious compared to free formulation for different reasons. It could be less toxic, could be more solubilized, could be even cellular target. But they will fail in toxicity. And my belief is that you have to do it in conjugation. You have to study toxicity very early in order not to to work on system that will never be able to translate. Never. And I think Hezi Bernholz today will give you some examples. Okay, we know for example on liposomes, I don't know if he will talk about this, but I assume he will, that positively charged lipids failed. Negatively charged lipid completely failed. Neutral in charge lipid depends. Coating depends. Okay? So, I think that you have to carefully analyze this. Any questions? Thank you for listening.